everybody, uh, Dr. Rick here dropping in. Uh, it's been a very long day, a very trying day. Uh, I am about to hit the spot and chill for a while. Got a little workout in. Uh, before I talk to you about what I'm going to talk to you about, uh, I definitely need to remind you that we are in the middle of a fundraiser. Uh, I say this every time that I do a video for the Black Voice, uh, and it's because uh, it's an agreement I made with the people I work with that I would. Uh, but more importantly now, it is because it's necessary. Um, we can talk and complain and we can uh, point fingers and blame and everything else but until we start to actually engage in community until we start to engage in collectivism until we start to engage in the pursuit of solutions in lieu of complaining all we'll ever be is complainers and uh sort of what i want to talk about uh, but we need your support the goal for this week is five thousand dollars uh, definitely appreciate you guys here's my challenge let's start here i'm challenging everybody who watches the, the video to at least click the link and go to the page to find out what we're doing to see what's possible to see how much could actually be done that's the challenge click the link and go I'm going to try to remember to remind you uh, before I finish. I have, over the past couple of weeks, I've literally been bombarded with all types of stuff that are going on that are people are asking for help. And it's par for the course is what's been going on. Dr. Michael Lynn Blanchard and I have been talking about this now for 10 years. About, you know, everything that's happening and being committed to it and looking at what's going on. Here's what is troubling me. You've probably heard me say this before, uh, but I'm going to try to shed some light on it. Uh, during a conversation back in 2014, I never will forget it, Dr. Blanchard and I were talking and just in the vein of the conversation and the frustration of the moment, I said that Black people are the most uncomfortable, most comfortable is uncomfortable people I've ever seen. And he, he kind of laughed and then he thought about it. And the quote actually ended up in his book of Lamentations uh, because it has context. When I said our people are the most comfortable is uncomfortable people, what I mean is we complain. If you were to judge us by our complaints, you would say, man, we are this close to revolution. Because the litmus tests all line up except for the action. We are upset. We'll throw a temper tantrum in a heartbeat. We'll tab some stuff. But that's that 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 that's not revolution. That's literally actually a cry out that gives those who are observing us an understanding that we still think we're powerless. Kids who have no power to get what they want from tantrums. Revolution, revolutionaries observe the moment and decide enough is enough and they take decisive strategic action. We're not doing that. The closest I've seen us come was Ferguson and we allowed um, the nonprofit industrial complex to run up in there by way of Black Lives Matter and a couple of others and totally shut that down. Misdirect the energy, misdirect the money, take everything and run. And now we're seeing years late, what, eight years later, eight, uh, what, yeah, eight years later, we're seeing that um, everything that Neota Ura and Darren Seals and myself cried out completely because I was being fed by them. 
what was going on. I'm, I'm listening to what they're saying. I'm reading what they're saying and I'm looking at it and I'm going, hey, there's a problem here. There's a problem here. A lot of the people that are being put on the ground aren't really from Ferguson and they're there as part of, uh, a part of the uh, campaign to disrupt and then here comes Black Lives Matter, a group that doesn't even have a vein for uh, the traditional heterosexual male. Even when you go, even when you went to their site, you know they're making money off of the death of one. You know, you know. I mean, all the way up to George Floyd, they were still running the game. They were running the grip, and everybody was giving. That's nearly a hundred million dollars unaccounted for. But other than that, nothing. We, 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 we sit around and we complain. We look, we, 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 we say we're going to vote our way out of situations despite 50 years of voting um, and getting nothing regardless of what party was in office. No matter who you say you voted for, you haven't gotten anything. We've actually digressed. We've actually have witnessed um, a... We've witnessed... An expansion of the wealth gap. We have expansion exact stagnancy in home ownership. We control nothing. We fight over everything. We whine and complain about anything. And we don't take action. From Oscar Grant. Or Amadou Diallo. We can go back that far. Um. Uh, from Amadou Diallo to George Floyd and beyond to Breonna Taylor and beyond. And we're, we're talking about senseless and unjustified killings, but we are being mollywhopped in every area of life, in finance, in banking, in home ownership. We are being fedangled in home ownership. I wrote a piece about how... Uh, appraisers were appraising homes uh, compar comparable homes differently based on race that black families were it was obvious when you walk in the home and you're doing the appraisal that the home is owned by black owner was getting significantly lower appraisals in the same area with the com with comparable homes if you understand real estate you run comps to get value assessments and the comps are based off of homes that are in the same area with a certain radius uh, geographical uh, radius and same square footage, same bill. So if it's a two-story erection and you're looking for two-story homes, same square footage, same amount of bedrooms, blah, blah, blah. How much did they sell for per square foot? Well, they're being appraised for resale value a lot lower for blacks. Why is that? Your resale value is the value of your home. It's going to determine as you pay down and build equity in your home when your home actually becomes an asset. Uh, also, how much of an asset it will be. Uh, on the flip side of that, it's the reverse when it's time to uh, appraise and assess for tax purposes. Uh, in that instance, black-owned home, black homes were being assessed higher property values than white homes. Why? Because the taxation is a liability. You're going to pay more in taxes for a home that is being valued for resale at lower price. That's just in homes. Then the lending practices, you know, to even build businesses and build homes and improve uh, neighborhoods. You can't get it to improve your neighborhood, but when they want to come in and start the gentrification process, they can. The problem is they can do it because we aren't responding correctly. We are frustrated. A lot of us who have the ability to respond, a lot of us who have the ability to break bread and, show, uh, and share knowledge, are just happy with not being negatively affected by what's going on, or at least not at a level that makes us uncomfortable. We are doing well, we're, we're doing our thing, so we're good. The problem is you don't see the long game. Eventually, once we become uh, statistically irrelevant in every category, we're already at the bottom, of the bottom rung of the socioeconomic ladder in every statistical category. When that number becomes so low that it's statistically irrelevant, meaning that our presence isn't needed and there's no value in catering to us 
And this is already happening because we've already been replaced as the largest minority in the country. That's already happened. And then uh, we are now looking at a situation where we are in appearance doing better, but when you look at where we're at in how much wealth we own versus how much wealth they own, wealth is about power. It's not about just how much you have. It's about the power you have. How much you have in reverent, in, in, in reference to how much someone else has determines your power. Having a million dollars mean nothing means nothing in a room full of billionaires. You get what I'm saying? You talk about your 1.4 trillion all the time, the buying power. We're the ninth richest. If we were a nation, we'd be the ninth richest nation in the world. Well, that You're not a nation, and you're not the ninth richest nation in the world. You're the most impoverished population in your country. Yes, you have 1.4 trillion in spending power, depending on how you break that down. But let's just say you have 1.4 trillion dollars. Sounds great, 1.4 trillion in spending power. I'm gonna explain that to you so you understand it and why it's not what you think it is. First and foremost, you have to look at it in proper context. That 1.4 trillion is part of a 100 plus trillion dollar economy. Now you're talking about owning less than 1% of the wealth. Here's the bigger problem with the 1.4 trillion. It's not 1.4 trillion, trillion in assets or revenue generation. It's 1.4 trillion in buying power. Pay attention to the wording. 1.4 trillion in buying power includes the credit access that you have. and means that more than likely a great deal of that spending power is debt. It's the use of credit to buy. It's not simply what you have in, 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 in liquidable assets or even in hard assets. It's what you're able to do because you have credit, a credit line, and that's debt. And debt is the number one enemy to wealth. You're being driven by an idea that does not serve you. Sounds good, but it doesn't serve you. Pay attention, learn how to understand, learn how to read between the lines. My concern and my problem is that we don't take action. We have far too many brilliant minds not to come together. We have far too many people who have already presented solutions to a great deal of the dilemmas and enigmas that we face and we won't get behind them. We have some of the most ingenious children and we're not protecting them. We're exposing them to the very system that wants to destroy them and we're wondering why we're getting the results we're getting. Look, I could talk on this all day long. Here's, here, 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 here's the bottom line. The bottom line is we are failing. We're failing in collectivism. We're failing in unity. We're failing in taking proper action. We don't have an agenda. We don't have protocols in place. We don't have anything we're actively pursuing that presents a long-term vision of how we can move out of this thing. We keep talking reparations, but since Johnny Cochran uh, passed away, uh, there has been really no real true move to create legislation. Dr. Anderson is probably coming as close as anybody that I've seen. You got politicians playing loosely with, we're going to do a study on it. You don't you didn't need a study for any other group, but you want to do a study for us. What do you need to study about 246 years of child slavery, 12 years of reconstruction, 20 years of black codes and convict leasing, 70 years of Jim Crow segregation, redlining, benign neglect, urban renewal, uh, urban renewal, uh, m mass incarceration, m miseducation. What 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 do you need? What what do you need to study? I can tell you based off of some of the uh, numbers that I've studied, we're talking a minimum of fourteen trillion. A minimum of fourteen trillion. See, the problem is they don't have it. A thirty something trillion in debt. There's some problems going on. My thing is. This country is primed for us to make our move. This country is primed for us to stand up and move into a position of power and to reposition ourselves by doing things that we should be doing. The problem is we won't come together. We won't get behind things. My biggest concern is how uncovered our children are. 
We're not holistically educating them. We're not properly racially socializing them. We are not giving them an identity and a vision. We are not turning over to them something that they can start. They're starting at the same place we started at, ground zero. Because we refuse to build for them, we refuse to cover for them, we refuse to develop them, we refuse to provide them with insight, we refuse to prepare them. They're getting up and they're coming up with the same mindset that held us back, that stagnated us. And we're coming into, and there's too many of us to do this. There's too much information out there for us to be sitting on it and being okay with it. We're too comfortable being uncomfortable, and that has to change. Look, I could talk about this all day. There's so many things that if you study, if you listen to, uh, if you, you go back and listen to uh, the lectures and read the books and the writings of Naeem, Dr. Naeem Agbar, uh, Dr. Han, John Henry Clark, uh, Dr. Yosef ben Yakin, and Dr. Neely Fuller Jr., Dr. Francis Cress Welton, Wilson, Dr. Amos Wilson, and you go on and you start to look at what they're talking about from a from a psychological and historical perspective. You start looking at Claude Anderson, looking at Umar Johnson, looking at Dr. Boyce Watkins, and talking about the things that we can do from an economic and psychological perspective. If you start looking at the 25 books I've written, the over 1,000 academic papers I've written, the thousands of kids I've gone to bat for in public school systems, the other kids that I'm dealing with that are suffering and struggling with mental health. The rite of passage program I created. I mean, there are some people out there. I just came across another brother. Uh, can I think of his last name? Tehran, that someone turned me on to. Uh, I believe he's in Ohio. I'm looking to connect with him because he's doing work with father, young black fathers. That There are some people out there. They, they can't get their footing because we jump on bandwagons like Black Lives Matter because it's shiny and it's big and it's got a money uh, machine behind it. Uh, George Soros for Black Lives Matter. You take an organization that's backed by a billionaire and you give them all your money. They take your money, they run and they buy homes and now everybody's wondering and at the gates of their homes trying to get an interview for explanations of what they did with the money. But we know they didn't do a damn thing in Ferguson. They snatched that from that. The, the, the place that needed it the most got nothing. Ferguson was ground zero. It was a place that we could have literally planted a flag. And it could have been the mecca of change for black people. We, I mean, I don't know how many people actually uh, are aware of just how close we came. And they knew what to do. They know how to disrupt us. Every time we start to get traction, every time we start to move, the Black Panther Party, Black Nationalist Party, hip hop, they tore up hip hop because hip hop was way more than music. It was way more than poetry. It wasn't simply just that. It was a culture of empowerment and they knew what was going on with it. We were literally filling the mind, those minds of kids with, yeah, we were hitting them with beats and we were hitting them with fun. That The commercial part was good, but we were hitting them with some stuff, man. We, 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 we had groups that were literally feeding these kids real, well, it was us kids, because we was kids back then, it was feeding us stuff we didn't know about ourselves. You know, I learned what an ankh was from, actually, I take the back, I learned what an ankh was from paying attention to album covers on Earth, Wind, and Fire. But I learned so much about what it meant from the X Clan, man. Why, you know, well, you know, and, and 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 so much more. And that's just, I mean, diggable. I mean, just we had it, and we let them take it, let them just turn it to trash, because we didn't see the value enough to protect it. I'll tell you something even even funnier. They told us that twerking was classless, ghetto, hood, and then they had us policing one another to talk about how trashy it was when we saw someone uh, 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 of our makeup, our color, our race doing it. And then these son of a bitches opened twerk studios all over the United States and then would determine whether they would hire the black women to teach in it or not. They get us every time. Now, 
Can we make something trashy? Can we turn it into something that loses its history? This, it wasn't a, some, moving your hips like that isn't new. You trace that back year, years and years and years and years and years in the homeland. But it wasn't sexual. It was, it was rhythmic. It was spiritual. Yeah, and it had an intimate feminine side to it. But the thing is, they told us one thing and then turned around and made billions off of it. We've got to be smarter. We've got to be more aware of what's happening around us. On that note, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. And as I said at the beginning, look, we're still doing a fundraiser. My challenge to you today is for those of you who are going to donate, please do. For those of you who are thinking about it or saying no, I'm challenging you just click the link and at least go to the site and look at what's being done. And then when you look at what's being done on that page, look at how many other pages on that site. Look at how much work has been done. Look at how much content has been presented. Look at the Blueprint 2.0, which is the blueprint for black empowerment. Look at the Black Code of Conduct. Look at Music is Life. Look at all the things that are there, that every last one of them isn't simply just some program. It has purpose. It has meaning. It does something. I am not a complainer. I talk about our problems, but it's always with the solution in mind. I have spent 30 plus years of my life searching for these solutions. The question is, I want to pass, at some point, I'm going to pass this on because I'm not going to be here forever. I would love to pass it on with it advanced further than it is now, but I'm going to do whatever I got to do no matter what. But I'm telling you now, we do way too much complaining to be sitting around the way we're sitting around. Absolutely too much damn complaining to be sitting on our ass, watching them take stuff from us, make money from us. They're making money off hip hop. They're making money off our dances. They're making money off our genius. Constantly, constantly raping us and raping our genius and our intellect while making us feel inferior. And then we submit our kids to this damn inferiority. Uh, so the suggestion of intellectual inferiority gives them an inferiority complex. We turn them over to the Eurocentric idea of what is. The Eurocentric idea of what's beautiful. The Eurocentric idea of what's uh, classy. The Eurocentric idea of what's professional. And then we police each other about that. Why are you wearing this? Why do you, you need to do this with your hair? We need to learn to embrace ourselves, but that comes with a systematic practice. We are systematically being moved away from passion. Look at it. Think about the passion of what was going on with Oscar Grant. Oscar Grant got killed. Sean Bell got killed. Uh, and we come on down the line uh, with Tamir Rice and Mike Brown and and and, and um, Trayvon Martin and, and all. And, 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 and that's just in the vein of our babies being killed for no reason. We're not even talking about other, but we, we we had a passion when we lost Sandra Bland. Sandra Bland. Then, very little about that. We had a passion. Now, look at your timelines. Look at your timelines. Look what we're talking about. Look at the bullshit that we get caught up in conversations with while we're in the situation we're in. We're turning our we're turning a world over to our children that may be worse than when we found it. We know how to complain and we're teaching them the same thing. I would want to leave my kids with more than what I had when I came and I would want to leave them with an understanding of what they're capable of doing. But that's going to require work. That's going to require an investment. That's going to require us to be committed to something outside of trying to get our shine on. People always ask me, man, well, what you have going on? Why aren't you doing something else? You could take this vein and you can do this. You could be the next this and you could be the next that. Number one is my character means a lot to me at this point in state in my life. Uh, how I'm remembered means a lot to me. I, I don't want to be anybody's fool. I don't want to get caught up in any buffoonery. That's why you don't see me flexing with some of these other cats that own things, saying stuff that I know I, uh, isn't what needs to be said. I don't, I don't have time for that because things will play themselves out and people will see what's sincere, what's real, what has intrinsic value. 
I'm real careful about what I get into because I love my people. And more importantly, I'm leaving this legacy that I'm building to my progeny. And I want them to see that, yeah, that was a time I was caught up in myself, but I grew up. And things started to matter to me. And a part of what mattered to me was them. And so I started to move different. I started to live different. I started to fight harder. I started to try to build. And instead of just building for them, I, I decided I want to help my people build. It's time to stop complaining. It's time to start taking action. Look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Um, thank you, guys. I was definitely not thinking about being this long. Uh, but whatever it is, look. Click the link. Go to the site. Check it out. If you believe in what you see, show some love. We're trying to raise $5,000 uh, this week. Um, really need to raise more than that. Uh, but let's just start there. Let's just start to see if we can build some momentum. Um, also, people who are doing work in the community and you're in the same vein where you got something going, but you just can't get over the hump, connect me. We need to start networking. We need to start sharing. We need to start working with each other and assisting each other. This has to be a collective effort. We've got to get off our islands. We've got to start doing it. And definitely, anybody who has a daughter or son or a young woman or a young man who is going through it, send them to us. I don't care what resources we have and don't have. We are going to look out for our people. I'll figure it out. Um, uh, just we've got to do better. Look, so on that note, I'm about to get out of here. I'm about to go and unwind. I definitely didn't want. I had a very rough day in a number of my clients were going through it themselves and this is you know dealing with mental health is what I do for a living and also performance psychology I help people win in life as well but man it takes a lot out of me as an empath to, to deal with that and I don't think people realize that and I talked about that today if people knew how many times I had to drag myself out of bed to get up and do what I do because of the, the burden I was carrying they would be shocked how many times all I had in me was to answer the bell, but I got up and I did it. How many times I was broken, man, I, I just I just to share it with people. Man, this year, I had the breath snatched out of me. I have never hurt the way I've hurt, but I had to get up. I had to go put it in because people depend on me. And I teach the kids that I come in contact with that that's life is coming. It's going to hit you. And some days it's going to knock the living fire out of you. It's going to hit you so hard you're going to be gasping for air. But you got what it takes. And I'll continue to teach them that as long as I've got breath in my body. But we're going to have to start doing more than what we're doing. On that note, look, I'm about to get off of here. You guys, thank you for stopping by. Uh, I appreciate it.